Welcome to Wisdom from the from our neighborhood tonight. Um, we're really happy to have you all join us. Uh, tonight's a, a, an occasional uh, pot webinar that we're going to be doing uh, called Lessons from the Road. And so I'm so happy to have with me tonight uh, Alana, Anila, and Hamza, who I'll introduce here in just a minute. We're all folk that are engaged in countering uh, violent, countering uh, hate uh, or fear um, uh, in in the United States of America. Um, this is this webinar is uh, sponsored by uh, Paths to Understanding, which is formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Um, our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Um, tonight we have with us Alana Suskin, who's an educator, an activist, and a writer. She's the editor of the progressive blog Jew School, and she's served as an assistant rabbi at Adas Israel in Washington, D.C. She reaches across faith traditions to fight Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. We also have with us tonight her partner in the Pomegranate Initiative, Hamza Khan, who's the founder of the Pluralism Project, an organization working to empower everyday Americans hailing from diverse narratives in our political process. He's worked as a campaign manager and communications consultant in local and national campaigns and was presented with a Rising Star Award by Political Magazine. So thank you both for being on. And then we also have Anila Afzali, who's the founder of MAPS Amen, the American Muslim Empowerment Network of the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. She's an activist, public leader, and member of the board of the Faith Action Network. And I'm Terry Kylo, the executive director of Paths to Understanding and also the founder of Neighbors in Faith. So uh, first of all, Hamza, I just wanna ask you uh, how you and your family are doing in the midst of, of all the changes with COVID-19. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, we, are, we are coping with it. A family member of ours is currently ill um, with COVID-19. So everyone please say a prayer for them to recover. Uh, it's been a somber time because of that, but we've, we've also learned a great deal in terms of spirituality. Um, you know, being blessed as an American um, and as a Muslim, I, I'm just so touched by the number of people who've reached out and said prayers for our family um, from every faith tradition. I think it's the first time in history that a Muslim has had Hindu temples, Sikh temples, Buddhist monasteries, synagogues, churches of every order and mosques, um, all praying for them. So uh, just, it's, it's a, a very powerful thing. It's very pluralistic, so to speak. So thank you for asking, Terry. Yeah, Neela, how's it been for you? Well, I will say we just finished our Ramadan, the month of fasting, uh, also a month of celebration in a lot of ways, a month of reflection and reconnection to God, to our faith. And it's usually also about community, but obviously this year was very different with uh, COVID-19. So we were not able to really enjoy and benefit from the communal aspects of the blessed month of Ramadan. At the same time, I have to say, and this is the message that I've also heard from so many Muslims that I've spoken to, they found this this Ramadan to have been one of the best of their lives. And I think just having that time alone, that isolation, that ability to really focus on what's truly important, you know, our relationship with God, and then also making the, the month of Ramadan uh, less about distractions, including the distractions that may come with communal gatherings and, you know, iftars and all the food and the celebration, and really focus on what the message of Ramadan is all about, and hopefully increase ourselves in the giving and the gratitude and the uh, self-reflection and connection to our Lord. Uh, it has just been absolutely beautiful. Uh, obviously, Eid, which is our celebration at the end of Ramadan, was also impacted by COVID-19. Uh, so that was uh, unfortunate that we weren't able to have our big celebrations as we us usually do, uh, but we tried to make the most of it, including, for instance, at MAPS, the Muslim Association of Puget Sound, uh, we had sort of uh, the place decorated with balloons, and then there was a drive-through Eid celebration, and people were able to drive through, pick up little goodie bags and treats, and uh, we had over a thousand goodie bags that were given to about a thousand different cars and backed up traffic for a long, the long ways as well. But uh, it was a good, it was a good celebration despite the limitations that we're facing with COVID nineteen. Thank you, and Alana, how about you and your family? We're doing okay. I mean, thank God, um, we have not been directly affected by it. But of course, you know, we have many friends who are reporting, you know, deaths in their families and um, you know illness, and there's a lot of concern in the air, just as with I think all Americans. But um, we're also we're also in the middle of an interesting. I think um, the last time we met, we had just done we had just finished Passover, and we were in the middle of the counting of the Omer up to Shavuot, which actually begins Thursday night. 
um, which is the celebration of our giving when we receive the law at Mount Sinai, or actually when we receive it every year at Mount Sinai, it's how we think of it. And it, the traditional way that we celebrate it is actually we spend all night awake um, learning and studying and uh, frequently we eat a lot of cheesecake. Cheesecake, uh, eating dairy is associated with it because it's sort of a, you know, you don't eat meat because it's, you know, meat is killing versus dairy, which is like life-giving. And um, it'll be interesting to see how we sort of navigate that this year because, you know, there's restrictions on how we interact with each other on these holidays um, and we can't be together. So it'll be, you know, it's going to be very strange this year. And uh, next time we meet, I'll let you know how it went. Yeah, I know for myself, uh, it feels like a little bit of normalcy or a little bit of like, like a rhythm and pattern have begun to reemerge, you know, for us a little bit. And I noticed uh, when I led a, a service online um, on Sunday that I, I felt more comfortable. And uh, I even, you know, broke out my guitar and sang a little song and stuff. And uh, it, it, but it's, it's been really interesting to watch the conversations happening within wisdom communities about uh, when to gather again and and when what are the conditions under which that's going to happen so there's a lot of complications uh you know for all these all these wisdom communities and and everyone's basically saying the same same sort of thing i, I heard it from the the leader of the muslim association of puget sound on tv the other day uh the, the biggest question is how do we love our neighbor right. moving forward how do we practically do that in a time when there's a pandemic and it's uh, but but I'm feeling more a little bit more comfortable uh, these days because we're just getting used to some of these uh, these new ways of communicating. Um, so I, I thought you know all four of us have spent a lot of time you know on the road, uh, literally and figuratively, um, in, in trying to counteract uh, hate and bigotry and fear. And so having been on the road like that, I think it's important to take a moment or two and ask the question, well, what led you to go on the road in the first place? Mm. Like, what is it that, um, that got you to, to leave whatever career you have or make adjustments to your career in such a way that you could spend time out in public uh, working to counteract um, hatred and bigotry? And I'd just like each of us to take a couple of minutes and, and share, share a little bit of our story about why we're doing that, how we felt called to do that if we do. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering if I could put Alana on the spot first and ask you to go first. Sure. Um, there was no real sort of aha moment for me. I've always, even when I was a, a little kid, um, my family comes from, um, my grandparents were, all four of them were immigrants um, and, you know, escaped, uh, several of them escaped the Holocaust. Um, my grandfather was his only, really the only surviving member of his family and um, so that was a message that was imparted to us very early. And I, you know, like I, I didn't grow up very religious in sort of the Jewish sense, like we weren't um, traditionally observant. But, you know, I can remember these incidences throughout my childhood where, you know, like I remember thinking like uh, we were in a grocery store with my parents once and um, I wanted like a box of fried chicken or something like that. And my dad was like, absolutely not. That company bust unions. We're not buying it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was sort of like, you know, with my, <laughs> that was the way we were raised. And um, I guess as I grew older, I just really wanted to come and be part of making a better world for us all. And I think where I started that actually was not with the Pomegranate Initiative, but I spent the last um, seven years working at an organization, Americans for Peace Now, and even before that, working with um, organizations in Israel, um, working to make peace or two-state solution between Palestinians and Israelis. And that was actually, I think, where I had my entry into the world of doing work like this um, to bring people together um, which really started for me, I guess, sort of parallel with when I went to rabbinical school and I started, um, I went to the West Bank and I met people who, you know, I wanted to understand what was going on and that was really important for me. And so that was how I got engaged in that work then. And it's come to um, working with Hamsa on the Pomegranate Initiative is just really an extension of that work as well. That, you know, here working on it, focusing on here in the U.S., we also have issues with, you know, 
uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, as you all both know, that we also need to bridge those gaps. Thank you. Uh, Hamza, I'm interested in you. How, how did you sort of get started doing this work of countering hate? Uh, well, I, I didn't really have a, a career change, if that's one way to start. This has been my um, entire life, going back to when I was a, a teenager in high school. So I think it was the second week um, I was in high school that September 11th occurred when I was a freshman. And living in the Washington, D.C. area, right outside of... Um, right outside of, of the city, really, um, and having so many of my classmates who either worked at the, Pen like, who had parents who worked at the Pentagon or had family friends who worked at the Pentagon, it, uh, it left a pretty, you know, indelible impact on me. Uh, and it got me thinking as a young person about those critical questions of why are we here? How have we come to this point in our history? Where is all this hate coming from, this external hate towards Americans? Because I had never seen um, any sort of uh, any sort of division in the identity of being a Muslim and being an American. I mean, we took First Amendment freedom for for granted at that point in time, um, and the freedom of of practicing one's faith. And so, um, being the curious young person I was, I went into a journey of introspection and then also research, um, and learned about the world as much as I could. And what I came across was the necessity of there to be bridge builders between the Muslim American community and the non-Muslim American community so that we can come back as one greater whole. As we like to say, I mean, as, as the Lord has told us in the Quran, um, uh, O mankind, verily we made you from one soul into many nations and tribes so that you might come to know one another. Uh, the wording of that, so that you might come to know one another, I think is... Uh, very important because to me it suggests uh, a manifest destiny for America as a meeting place for all nations and tribes. And so as an American, I felt a particular calling towards wanting to bring together um, people of all callings, of all faiths, and to work towards overcoming hate and fear um, as they had been slowly inculcated into us by external elements who were both un-American and unpatriotic uh, if they were here, and if they weren't here, they they had a, a clear agenda that they that they made clear that was to divide Americans and divide America from the world. Um, you know, I not to wax too political here. I believe we are a city on the hill. I believe, in particular, us being a city on the hill means that we want everyone to be on the hill with us. Uh, and the only way we can do that is to counter hate. So that's how I ended up in the in the space that I am today with all of you. Wow. Sister Anila, how about you? Yeah, so I've had a little bit more of that aha moment or big career change, uh, as most of you already know. Uh, for me, I mean, I, I grew up with a strong sense of justice. I did actually a lot of bridge building work and combating hate and misinformation, even, uh, you know, in high school and college. I started this group called Common Ground to bring people together. And I actually went to law school to study human rights because I believed in the importance of every human being having value and dignity and everything else. Uh, but it wasn't until I had a spiritual transformation that really reconnected me, reconnected me back to my faith roots and really brought me back to being much more religious uh, in nature uh, that I decided, you know what, I need to really make a big change in my life. And it was at that moment, and I was uh, at the time general counsel of a healthcare IT company, I decided I have to leave my legal career even. I need to take a pause, reassess my life, and really dedicate myself to service and knowledge. And that's what I did, since those are two values that are very strongly emphasized in Islam. So I actually up and left uh, my legal career in 2013 and pursued knowledge, uh, did this Quran intensive program. Uh, that same year, got to do the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, reached sort of the spiritual high uh, and absolutely loved it. And I also experienced how, uh, or I, I saw how there was a lot of misinformation, uh, not just out there by accident, that there was this intentional effort to spread 
uh, Islamophobia by an entire industry that was very well funded. It was a small industry, but very well funded and very effective in spreading lies and misinformation. And I sort of made it my mission to address those lies and that misinformation because this is the same time that I'm going through this experience of learning and just getting more and more amazed and finding so much beauty and love and peace and, and spirituality and connectedness in Islam that I'm hearing all these lies about it being told. And it's like, I know it's a lie because I'm directly reading the text. I'm directly experiencing uh, Islam. Uh, in my own life, I saw the positive change in my family uh, uh, with Islam and everything. So I just naturally started addressing those kinds of uh, myths and misconceptions uh, and started working on bridge building and it just so happened that as I became more involved with my mosque uh, the leadership actually approached me and asked what my future plans were and I had this idea this vision for amen American Muslim Empowerment Network with the specific areas and goals and everything uh, but I just didn't think it was feasible financially and I had drained through all my savings for the three years that I was not working I uh, had borrowed money from my sister and was actually interviewing different legal uh, uh, jobs at the time too uh, when they approached me so I just feel like it was divinely, uh, the, the puzzle fit together so well that I just can't help but believe that there was divine uh, uh, intervention or assistance involved in that decision making. Uh, so when they said, come and do this through MAPS, I loved it. Uh, and we launched MAPS Amen. And I've been involved in this work since. And I just feel so blessed and grateful to be on the front lines, working with people like all of you and so many other good people and seeing the kind of transformation and impact we can have, even in the face of this multi-million dollar industry that that seeks to divide us, that seeks to spread hate, that seeks to promote violence in really ugly ways. Wow. Yeah, you know, for, for myself, it my, my journey in some ways started about 20 feet away from where I am right now in front of my kitchen sink. Because um, I, was, I was speaking to a couple of Muslim uh, friends that day after having uh, done about four or five uh, small events with maybe between 50 and 100 people or so uh, with a Muslim friend. And, um, and, and that, that, that process made me realize how much fear there was. Because it's, it's one thing to be part of an audience and to see the fear in another person. It's something else to be in front of that audience, standing with a Muslim friend, uh, witnessing the, the, the rage and the fear that people uh, often were expressing in their questions and and uh, and and that began a pr whole process for me of of uh, of kind of recognizing also that there's something about our political climate right now that feels like we're at a a very dangerous time um, and i I kind of had felt before before the 2016 election that it, that it was quite likely that Donald Trump might win because I have family in Eastern Washington or part of rural communities. And I could, I could feel this kind of like fear of the other, like, you know, emerging. And, um, and so I began this, this journey of doing more events and, uh, and more and more events and called to do even more. And then finally, uh, during Holy Week of 2016, um, I was preparing for some sermons. I was trying to stay home and, and pray and get ready for the, for the four sermons I had to preach. And was talking to these two Muslim friends, and, and I said, you know, somebody needs uh, to go into churches and help prepare them to be good allies. Because the thing that we know that, that didn't happen in, in, for instance, Nazi Germany, was that there were not enough churches who stood up. There were not enough pastors who stood up uh, and said, no, this isn't right. And, uh, and so I, I, I said to these two friends I said, on the phone, I said, you know, um, I think somebody needs to go into churches and help prepare them to be good allies with our Muslim neighbors. And then I heard my voice say, I think I need to do that. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you know, and I could just feel it, I still feel it uh, now even that there was a weight on me when I said that. And so uh, as I've told the story before, I was waiting for my wife to come home and uh, and tell me not not to do that 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 was silly uh and uh so i told her that i had heard my voice say this and that i felt a great weight and all she said was is well what's for i think maybe you should do that you should listen to that voice what's for dinner <laughs> and i was hoping she'd kind of get me out of it but she didn't <laughs> and uh and so it's been quite a journey you know since then leaving leaving the churches i was serving 
starting Neighbors in Faith and now being part of Path to Understanding and getting to be meet so many folk like you all who are out there trying to put, um, uh, put us back together again as a people. And foundation for me in that, as I conclude here, is this like sort of like deep call inside my guts that we don't have to live this way. Yeah. That we are being divided from one another o over many kind of lines of difference. And that, that we do not have to fundamentally live that way as human beings or as people who are part of uh, this particular country, the United States of America. And I just, I hope that we can, we can, we can shift things enough to keep us from walking down a dangerous road. Inshallah, as we say, with God's will, God's help. You know, it's so interesting that you mentioned the 2016 election because that's actually when I met Hamza. So, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it seems like it's a lot longer ago than that. But um, so we live in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a very diverse place. It's I think it's the second most populous area for Muslims. Is that right? It's, it's it's up there in the top ten somewhere. It's we have a lot up there, and it's also a very it's uh, there's also a lot of Jews who live here. It's very diverse in general, you know, the, because we have government nearby, a lot of you know government workers, um, and yet in 2016 there was this you know rise in both Islamophobic and anti-Semitic um, events um, that was tracked. Them. Our our local uh, our local government actually tracks hate crimes, and it does a pretty decent job of it. And they were saying this is really unprecedented. And um, a number of rabbis in this area were very concerned about it. And I said, well, let's actually do something about it. And we convened a gathering. We initially, I thought it would be like, you know, like a clergy response group or something like that. And one of, uh, one of my colleagues, Charles Arian, Rabbi Charles Arian, brought Hamza to sort of give us an overview of the Muslim community in our area. And he did this, did this amazing job. Um, and the, the response group didn't really pan out, although of course there's a lot of goodwill, um, both from the rabbis and from the, the imams who attended. Um, but what we ended up doing was actually sort of, we kept in touch and we started talking about this and we realized that Montgomery County wasn't gonna be enough. You know, Montgomery County is really diverse. There's already a lot of pieces in place here but what we needed to do was really, as you say, to reach out to churches and areas where they don't know Jews and they don't know Muslims, either because there aren't any there or the, the mechanism isn't there for them to interact. And that is actually how we ended up starting Pomegranate Initiative last year, is we finally were like, we've got to do this. We've got to start actually going to these places and talking to people about it and building these relationships so that they can stand up with us and say, I, you know, I know a Jew, I know a Muslim. They're not like that. This is what, this was our, what our experience of Jews is. This is what our, our experience of Muslims is. Let me explain to you why you don't need to be afraid. Yeah, we also had a similar uh, uh, mindset in, in, in the work that Reverend Terry and I have been doing. You know, this is part of why we decided when we launched a Faith Over Fear Roadshow, we decided we wanted to take this message uh, of unity, of sort of overcoming the fear and the divisiveness by going to smaller rural towns, places where they might not have large Muslim populations or large Jewish populations or much diversity in general, and really bringing that message there because it's one thing to share the message in places like Seattle, for instance, it's sure. quite a different thing to share it in, you know, Moses Lake, for instance, or someplace else. So uh, we've been trying to do that as well, because uh, the more that people actually get the opportunity to interact and actually meet people from different groups, whatever marginalized group we're talking about, the less likely they are to fall victim to these misinformation campaigns that are out there because they have a real personal relationship, hopefully, that they can refer to when there's sort of this kind of uh, these lies being spread. So that was part of the thinking and uh, rationale behind our work as well. And I agree. Yeah, I mean, because uh, I grew up in a town of 300 people. And uh, if, if uh, and, you know, often very good hearted people, there's, there's a fair bit of racism. Uh, that's also a part of that community. But but if, if they meet somebody, they tend to like them. And, uh, and, so if, and so I kind of learned from that, you know, watching a number of scenarios happen in my hometown, that, that if people could meet some Muslims, if they could meet a Jewish person, 
and have a conversation that just deeply changes something. And then I learned as well um, from the Japanese American community that there was not the same kind of internment uh, process in Hawaii as there was in the West Coast of the United States, despite the fact that there were many American and Japanese Americans in Hawaii. And the reason was is because they had allies stand up and say, you're not going to do that here. They are part of our community. This, you're, if you attack them, you're attacking all of us. And so, um, you know, to get to get people uh, uh, an opportunity to meet somebody. So I've I've watched maybe 20, 25 events with Anila, where Anila is the first person who's Muslim that they people have ever met. And you can watch people walk away just in a very different mindset and much more confident. To, 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 to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, maybe the fear that, you're, you know, that, that, they're, that their friend or their neighbor or their family member is getting captivated by, uh, maybe, maybe you should step back and, and get to know a real Muslim. Yeah, and that's what's been so powerful is when we've been able to experience those personal transformations. Uh, I know the first roadshow event that you and I did, Terry, where we went uh, to Vancouver, Washington, a small town, uh, I had two people come up to me and admit to me that they had fear, that they had that kind of hate, uh, and they even cried. I mean, they shed tears and, and asked if they could give me a hug. And it was a very different experience for them, for me. It was so powerful, very different from what, what I had antis anticipated the event to be like. And I think that's part of what I, I personally feel is missing in our country, is there aren't enough people who are willing and able to, in a, an effective way, to reach across the aisle and sort of welcome people like that, allow that space for transformation, recognize that you might not be where I want you to be, where you probably want to be, but allow for that kind of growth rather than just demonizing, you know, uh, labeling them all as racist or whatever else, Islamophobic or anything else. Uh, I think we need to have more of those kinds of opportunities for people to learn the truth, see reality, uh, meet people individually, and be able to even transform. And I think one of the most powerful things that I experienced going around with you, uh, Terry, is that you are able to model for folks folks, how they also can have that transformation. And I've had this with other uh, uh, leaders as well from different faith backgrounds. I remember in particular an evangelical uh, minister, uh, Jeff Burns. We did an event for evangelical Christians at MAPS, and that was the first time that the majority of them had probably ever stepped inside a mosque. And to have an event like that and to have somebody, uh, Dr. Jeff Burns is somebody who used to hate Muslims, and he admits that openly, and he had his heart and life changed by a five-year-old old Muslim child and he tells his story and he allows people to also uh, have that ability to change themselves because they can say hey if Jeff changed I can change too so having those kinds of experiences I think is really powerful and I just feel like those messages need to be out more those stories need to be told far more than the regular negativity that we are seeing and experiencing uh, through mainstream media or otherwise yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping to have, in fact, I've got Jeff and a few other evangelicals coming on in about a month or so uh, to come on and tell their stories. I'm looking, looking forward to that very much. Um, so as we've been out on the road and we've been engaging with people, um, what, are, what are some of the things that, that have led people to places of fear and, and hate even? Like, what is it about human beings? What is it about the particular people we've met that, have, that, that, are, that could kind of help you know, all of us understand how to understand them better. Do we have any stories we'd like to share? I mean, I don't have a story specifically, um, but, you know, I do think there's, there's a certain amount of the hate and fear that actually comes simply because humans are herd animals, you know, in a certain sense that when you're surrounded by people with, who are giving you a specific message, it's really hard to break away from that. And I know we've, we've all talked about that in terms of like, how do we, how do we break out of that is by creating, you know, subcultures um, who can speak to it with, you know, other voices. But I really do feel that um, our call out culture doesn't help that, <laughs> you know, in the sense that, you know, it, that if we can, if we point out the negative constantly, it doesn't give people an opportunity to sort of pretend, you know, like it's hypocritical in a sense, but hypocrisy is actually not necessarily always bad. I know that's a funny thing to say, but to let people say, actually, you know, maybe I don't hate this person or, you know, maybe, maybe I can leave my past behind without repudiating 
everybody I know, um, just simply by opening the door a little bit and saying, okay, um, I've met this person now and we can sort of pretend our way through the next steps while I adjust from what I was to what I will be. I think one of the most um, visceral stories I can recall of, of hate uh, in my life goes back to right after 9-11 when I was in line at, in the lunchroom just trying to get lunch and uh, a young man in front of me who happened to be Orthodox Jewish uh, turned around and realized that I was Muslim um, and just went off for about, I think, five minutes straight of just cursing at me uh, for being there and for being Muslim. It was very strange. What, what was really touching about that, though, is that three Jews actually rushed up and uh, started arguing with this young man, uh, trying to understand why on earth was he screaming at me in particular for being Muslim and why he thought it was appropriate to do that in the lunch line and why his anger was being directed at someone who clearly had nothing to do with 9-11 to begin with. And two of those, um, yeah, the, those, the two Jewish students that I recall, were, they were both Orthodox also. So they were making it, there was no, the, the idea of tribalism or division there just kind of fell apart. It was just one person in anger. That story stayed with me when I went to college because for uh, reasons unknown even to me now, I was president of a Jewish fraternity. And a majority of my, um, I can see Terry laughing over there at that. <laughs> and a majority, and Anila too, uh, a majority of my brothers were Orthodox Jewish and they came from families in inner city Baltimore that had been really hit hard by poverty and a lot of the struggles that inner city communities have been facing in the last three or four decades in the U.S. And they came from just a lack of knowledge. Uh, there was a lot of ignorance towards Islam. But the new was that I was a very effective president, made sure that they all went to Shabbat dinner and said their prayers on time on Saturday morning. But aside from that, um, you know, they, were, they knew so little about Islam. Uh, and the questions that they asked and the fears that they, they shared with me in our fraternity house and, and just on campus really came from the idea that they thought that Islam was out to subjugate them and kill them all. And that fear was coming from, like Anila pointed out, a certain lobby, a certain very tiny, well-funded group of C3 and C4 organizations that were simply taking advantage of the disarray that Muslim America was in after 9-11 and our inability to really um, articulate a singular position against what had happened. I mean, we all were condemned it as a community, but we, we struggled with the words necessary to show that we were in solidarity with our non-Muslim neighbors um, in a way that made them feel safe with us again. And, you know, the sad thing about that is that if you go back all the way, because Memorial Day was yesterday, if you go back all the way to um, General Washington, he had Muslims serving in his army, like active Muslims. Um, and Muslims have been a part of our country's fabric going back to the slave trade when one quarter of the slaves in this country were Muslims who were brought here against their will, um, oftentimes sold against their will by other Muslims, particularly of Arab background, uh, which is, you know, heartbreaking in itself. And so for me, you know, going back and thinking about all this hatred and all this confusion that these young men had towards Islam, um, obviously breaking bread with them at Shabbat made a difference. I wouldn't partake in the drinking of wine. I'd let them get drunk and then listen to their crazy life stories. Um, but while not doing that and just breaking bread with them, uh, understanding that the fear was coming from uh, deliberately being misinformed and the lack of of the democratization of knowledge at the time. We're talking maybe a little bit more than a decade ago in college. So Wikipedia had just started. YouTube was a very, it was a startup. Um, the ability for knowledge to be shared, for us to have video conferences like this, it wasn't there. And that, that those barriers, those artificial barriers, so to speak, between people's ability to get the knowledge they needed uh, and and for people who had that knowledge to share it, it made a, it, it was really a challenge. Um, 
And only a handful of millennials were willing to be patient enough to cross those, you know, those bridges and bring people onto either side. I think today we're in a very different environment um, where we have so many young people of all faithful backgrounds who are organizing in these networks and through these uh, tools of social media that as a millennial, I can't even understand. We were joking before we got on that I, will, I can't even figure out how to do the Q&A thing on, on Zoom, and I really can't. It's, it's actually, I'm, I'm, I'm a disgrace to millennials and South Asians at the same time. Um, I'm just not good with tech. But young people have come such a far away in this country in terms of helping us heal and, and, and address these divisions. And the hatred part of it, um, you know, going back to the original question that Terry asked, it seemed to be from the lack of natural ability for us to connect. You know, the, the deliberate effort, I should say, rather than natural, the deliberate effort to keep Americans from being aware of one another because the division that was sowed was beneficial to one political class or one group of people who were trying to make money off of this while being pseudo intellectuals, uh, so to speak, the Islamophobia lobby in particular, and the anti Semitism lobby, which we have in this country too. Yeah. So yeah. You, I, you. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I definitely agree, though, the role that young people in particular play is critical and that there is this active effort to disconnect us, not just to not allow for the connections to naturally occur. Uh, so I agree with that. But I will say that I, I have to disagree a little bit uh, with, with Hamza on sort of uh, what happened yeah. post 9 11 uh, in particular, because I, I felt I, my recollection of it and my experience of it was that the American Muslim community was wholeheartedly uh, uh, and very clear and articulate and categorical uh, in the condemnation. And also, we saw all of America kind of unite. Uh, there wasn't the sense of dividedness at that time. And even I got to give credit to President Bush at the time, uh, who did speak out uh, and, and continue sort of drawing that connectedness between Americans, not identifying Islam in any way as, 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 the, neg as the enemy or anything like that. So there was a very strong uh, coal uh, coalition coming together of Americans uh, in response at that time. What happened was not that, you know, Islamophobia did not increase after 9-11. A lot of people attribute it to that, and that's not the case. Right. The data, yeah. yeah, research actually shows that that's not when Islamophobia rose. The Islamophobia went up later when it came to yeah. election times. And that's the reality of Islamophobia is that it is this manufactured kind of fear and divisiveness that we've been talking about with the lobby. So there was an intentional effort, again, in order for people to get political points, people to uh, be able to scapegoat and have an enemy, people, uh, an ability to direct people's natural fears and anxieties and concerns and, and loneliness and the jobs losses that were happening with automation and everything else, to be able to direct all of those negative emotions toward individuals or individual groups that are marginalized, especially when they are individuals or groups that most Americans don't know. So it's the lack of personal connection and the opportunity, the political gain that people wanted, and of course, the financial profit motive that drove a lot of these uh, Islamophobia industry organizations to really push and, and peddle this fear narrative uh, that was then taken a hold of. And part of it happened, you know, you have to understand that it happened when, um, when we no longer have the Red Scare. Right, communism fell, so that's no longer our big enemy. So there was this gap uh, in sort of having an enemy, and that that idea of having an enemy, having an outgroup, having an other, is so critical to humans in many ways. Particularly when we live in a country that does spend so much in, uh, you know, d defense. Right. And the amount of bombing that we have done in terms of Middle Eastern countries, which are majority Muslim countries, that would not be possible unless and until we had the ability to dehumanize them to some extent. So that has that has had a very practical uh, and political and financial purpose. Uh, so it's, it's all sort of connected to all of these reasons. And at the same time, it has not just been accepted by the people on the fringes, but it has become mainstream and it's even promoted by certain uh, organizations that we might consider you know, mainstream organizations or even organizations that we might hail as civil rights organizations that have also peddled or promoted some of these ideas that allow for the fringes to continue exploiting natural fears and promoting a hate agenda. And I think it's important, Neil, to add into that, um, that we don't see this agenda simply on the right or the left. We have Islamophobic elements on, in the progressive caucus too, on the left. Absolutely. And we have it in the center and we have it in the right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
to push back just a second about our, being articulate, I think at a national level, we were very articulate as a, as a community. I think local communities fell behind across the country only because we were new at this. We had never dealt with a, a crisis of this scale as a Muslim community. So that, that I think is what I was focused on is, is on, the, on, on the direct retail engagement side rather than the wholesale engagement at the national level. That uh, makes sense. Thank but, you. But, you know, you know, yeah. but just, to, just to kind of break in there for a second, because I, I think the other thing that was, that was missing to a large degree, even though we have some initiatives that got started around 2010, like the shoulder to shoulder campaign, you know, to, 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 to step up and try to be good at, create allies uh, to help counteract the Islamophobia industry, the, these, these, these well-funded hate groups. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with a lack of allies who are able to speak nationally because it's kind of a trap, isn't it? Uh, yes. To have to constantly be condemning some, uh, uh, actions which you yourself and your community didn't condone and, and, and had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. And yet other people are doing in your name. And so you're, even when you're, even when, when, when a group is condemning, they're still being associated with the violence that they had nothing to do with in the first place. And, uh, and, and so a, a lot of it, a lot of the rise of, 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 of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in the last decade has been because allies have not been clear enough and direct enough uh, to, to, to be, because when a community is under pressure, you know, they're not going to get listened to. But, but when, when other people will stand up with them and say, hey, wait a minute, y'all got this wrong. Um, on our social media campaign, Facts Over Fear, the, the thing that keeps coming up over and over again in the comment section is that people assume certain things about Islam or certain things about Jews that... Um, that, 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 that it's somehow that they're somehow a threat right and so and so who who is going to be able to respond to that it's going to be allies that are going to be able to respond to that and say hey wait a minute are you sure about that you know what what if you found out um how how proud american muslims are to be american right and uh so i, I think allies have a lot to answer for in the rise of, of both anti-semitism and islamophobia Thanks I do want to jump in with one thing that both Hamza and Anila touched on, though, which I think we glossed over maybe a little too fast. I'm putting on my poor people's campaign hat for a second, which is um, Hamza, you mentioned that so this this young man who you'd met in the line was from, you know, it was from Baltimore and that a lot of the people that you had met um, were had grown up in poverty. And I think poverty and militarism and structural racism um, and actually the environment, as the Poor People's Campaign says, these four things are all part and parcel of one another, and they're all part and parcel of the rise of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, and they're, they are mechanisms by which we are controlled, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very easy to, to raise people to anger against you know the outsider or somebody who can be set up as a as a middleman as Jews sort of traditionally have been right yeah. um, even though they're not the ones getting the profits it's somewhere further up the line you've got big corporations earning money off of you know poverty wages um, you know with CEOs earning 365 times what their you know what their lowest paid worker is, is uh, earning and of course people are going to be angry and the way to deflect that is find an enemy. And I think Anila definitely touched on that. We don't talk about that enough, like how much these issues are all deeply, deeply intertwined in, um, in money, you know, um, in very, in ways that we should be talking about very overtly and we get deflected from pretty consistently. You know, when was the last time um, any of our um, presidential candidates talked about poverty, like use the word poor people. Yeah, I think, I think when, if we think about it from a, from the point of view of, of our wisdom traditions, um, you know, I think about the story of Cain and Abel and, and, uh, you know, Cain was, was expecting that the way he was going to get in good with God in the story is if he could get rid of his competition. Um, but the thing about God is that um, God's love is 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 infinitely infinite, right? I mean, we that that's that's part of our understanding. But when people feel like they're only competing, 
when they don't have enough, when wealth and income inequality are on the rise, when they don't have the opportunity for an education, and when they feel like like their 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 um, their 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 future is slipping away, right? What right. what what do the powers that be do? They they get they get us fighting with each other instead of recognizing that the system of of, of institutional and structural racism and wealth and income inequality and all of that is actually what's causing us to feel so anxious. And then they, and then they just provide, you know, we'll, we'll go look, go point your anxiety at this group, go point your anxiety at that group. And so that all of us can't join together and make a better, make a better uh, way for us to move forward. And, you know, that reminds me of another lesson from the road. And I apologize if anyone else has a lesson, just go ahead and jump in. Um, going back to my time in, in Orthodox Jewish Baltimore, uh, I, I, conducted serious outreach one-on-one -on -one directly to rabbis in, uh, in, in that part of town to just build relationships. Uh, and it took a lot of patience. What I discovered was a great challenge for, for someone who's wanting to build alliances is that you have to be patient when people do not understand, one, your intention, and then two, the necessity of being allied. And three, how wrong their understanding of the world is. The, and, you know, this is why in Islam we focus so much on God being ar rahman ar rahim the, the all-merciful, merciful, the all-gracious. And the reason for him being all-merciful and all-gracious is because humans are kind of stupid. Uh, it takes us a while for us to really get a message from God. Um, clearly, we've been trying to get him for thousands of years and we're not, not good at it still. Uh, and so working with folks who had preconceived notions about Islam, about Muslims, about the color of my skin, about my facial features and my very dangerous sounding name. Um, it takes a lot of patience. You have to sit and go through a lot of meetings, a lot of coffees, a lot of bagels, a lot of bagels, um, and then work out to burn off those bagels later. Uh, and even then, maybe only one out of three people that you've reached out to will want to have that kind of relationship. But I think that that's still very important. Uh, this is, again, coming from the Muslim side. Even if we are convinced that the people we're reaching out to are, as in the, the Quranic chapter Yasin, are pointed out to be completely cut off and will not listen to you, it's still worth a, chat, a try to reach out to them. Because another part of the Quran talks about uh, Moses and, and the tribes of Israel escaping from, um, through the Red Sea from Pharaoh. And in our tradition, we also believe that in those last moments when Pharaoh was looking up upon the Red Sea collapsing upon him, angels grabbed him and were stuffing sand down his throat in the fear that he might repent in that moment and be forgiven by God. So even in that moment, if God was willing to give Pharaoh another chance, so the angels were trying to stop that from happening. Very interesting uh, red tape there, actually. But... Um, what does it say about us? We should be get, willing to give every pharaoh a second chance, even certain pharaohs who are very bad at, at managing uh, national crises. <clears throat> we, should, we should really be thinking hard in terms of our own patience and how do we expand these alliances. Even the people that we know are trying to other us, we should be trying to figure out a way of how to end that and bring in those folks, the Jeff Burns of the world, into our coalition, into our greater, greater tribe of humanity, so to speak. Again, forgive me for being a little too kumbaya with that, but th th that's where my thoughts are going. No, I actually, I ag agree with that. And I think that's actually an important role that faith leaders and people of faith backgrounds can play in this, because I will be completely honest and say before I had my spiritual transformation, I would not have the patience that I have today, the love that I have today, the mercy and compassion that I have today to be able and willing to engage people who are literally, you know, showing up at a uh, anti-Muslim protest with hate signs on their, on their lap as they come to me at a Ask a Muslim booth and ask me questions questions and talk to me and share some really hateful messages. I would not be able to show them love and mercy and compassion and hold their hand as was captured by, by a Reuters photographer that I didn't even know was there uh, in, a, in an image that like I was really genuinely connecting with this person or thought I was or doing my best to do so. And it's because of my faith. 
My faith is what gives me that strength, that ability, that optimism, that hope, that, you know, like connectedness to humanity to be able to say, this is a fellow human being. You know, this is one of God's creations, God's beloved creations. And even if they may disagree with me, even if they may hate me, I don't hate them. I love them and I'm willing to take the time, the effort and show the patience and do it in a really beautiful way, exactly as the Quran commands us to do, is to talk to people in a really beautiful way uh, about sort of uh, who I am or who Muslims are or, or what Islam teaches and to have the patience even when they may attack me. I've literally had people drive by, roll down their windows and yell obscenities at me and I'm like, have a good day, you know, literally with a smile and not having that affect me. I could not have done that before my spiritual transformation. So I know it's my faith that gives me that strength. And I think that people of all faith backgrounds, whatever faith background or wisdom traditions they come from, if we can really draw from those traditions to get the strength and ability to do exactly that, to have these conversations with people in a truly loving way, in a truly patient way, uh, and recognizing that we may or may not convert them, but at least you know convert them to sort of this uh, peaceful, uh, loving uh, approach. Here. Not, <laughs> not, not convert them to a... <laughs> tradition, just to be clear, you know, bring them to the side of building bridges of unity, of loving each other, you know, loving our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, we might not succeed in that, but at least we've tried. And I think that's, that's what I love too about uh, our faith traditions about Islam in particular for me, is that we get judged on our efforts. It doesn't matter how many people, you know, we convince or not. Uh, Noah, you know, preached, we're told, for hundreds of years and was only able to uh, get about a few people to sort of listen to his message. We have to have that kind of patience that it doesn't matter who comes to sort of agree with us or not. They can still hate me walking away from me, but at least I didn't say anything that contributes to that. At least I did my part. I fulfilled my responsibility to my Lord regard and, and to God's creations. And, you know, in, in Islam in particular, for us, we're not reinventing the wheel here by building these relationships with other faiths. We're going back to the, the true fundamentals of Islam. From the very beginning, our faith was very dependent on the original black church. The original black church in Ethiopia is why so many Muslims are alive and well today in that part of the world. They saved Muslim uh, refugees from being killed by Arab, Arab pagans. And then separate from that, the number of monks who interacted with the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the number of, of rabbis who built relationships directly with him and stood with him actually, if we, if we read the record correctly, if we read the Sira, a Nabi, the, the traditions of the prophet, peace be upon him, we see that a number of rabbis and Christian leaders uh, and people who were simply unaligned felt so strongly about his commitment to social justice and this idea of tolerance and allowing all people to worship their creator in the way they wanted. Um, this is really going back to who we are as a people, as a faith. And here in America, you know, Benjamin Franklin himself said, you know, if, if the chief mufti of Istanbul wants to come and, and give a sermon in my own home, I'm happy to have him. This is who we are from the founding fathers onwards. As a country, we've always wanted all faiths to be welcome and a part of our, our fabric. Uh, and, you know, that's the great thing about having these conversations, you know, with the left coast and then all, all of us on the East coast here. Uh, I wish we were more left like you guys. Um, but, but, you know, we have better coffee. I know Seattle's known for its coffee, but we have more Yemeni coffee over here, Anila, than you do in Seattle. And Yemeni coffee is the best, I'm telling you. Well, now we have a problem. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so, Alana, anything, anything, anything that you've been learning about, about, like, you know, how to help people come together in the midst of this, uh, the midst of the work you're doing? I actually want to sort of touch on um, something that Anila said, and yeah. you sound like a much better person than I am, I have to admit. Um, but uh, in the sense that as long as, so we actually have a very similar um, uh, tradi phrase, tradition, like idiom, whatever the word is, um, that our sages say that you're not required to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't, Yes, it would be great if everybody to whom we reached out was able to have that aha moment. But in a certain sense, I've also found that there's a value simply to keeping the lines open, even if somebody's opinion doesn't change at all. Because as long as they're talking to you, there's some piece of them that admits that at least there's a human being on the other end of that conversation. 
and that's the first step. Even if they even if they can't get any further than that, you can keep talking to them. And as long as they'll keep talking back to me, I'm willing to engage. Even if they say things that are not in line with the way I see the world. <laughs> and I, I, I found over time that that's, it's true that you can build relationships with people, even if they have literally nothing in common with you, except the dedication to stay in the conversation. Well, I just want to say that when I first began uh, the work I'm doing, I was given this, uh, this quote from a rabbi, uh, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. You're not obligated to complete the work neither are you free to abandon it. Um, Rabbi Tarfan uh, Pirkei Avot. I'm not I'm sure. That's, that's, that's the one. Wisdom of the fathers. Sorry, Rabbi. I just yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, and so I, I keep this in my office right back there um, as a reminder to me of that. Um, hope, hope plays a huge role here. Um, there's a kind of doggedness. There's a, there's a sort, of, sort of determination that I've seen in all three of you to continue this work even when it's difficult, right? Um, Anila, I think you've, you've described that as, as something that sort of came to you through your spiritual awakening. Um, it, that's not just a head thing, right? It's a heart it, thing. It's a heart it's thing. Absolutely not a head thing, because if I put my head on, uh, my rationality, my lawyer, my competitive spirit, my desire to win and just sort of potentially run circles around some people in debates, <laughs> I, that would win over. My ego would win over. So it's absolutely not a head thing. It's absolutely a heart thing. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes a lot uh, to sort of put aside the ego, put aside the head, and really allow the heart to speak, because I think the heart is the, the place that we connect with God. And that's where I draw the patience, uh, the forgiveness, the love, the compassion, the mercy, uh, and the ability to do that. And also uh, touching on what the rabbi was saying, uh, specifically with people who've had these transformations or even changes in opinion on some of these issues, it's usually come when it's been online, people who are just kind of watching from the sidelines. They might not be engaged in the conversation. And that's something important. The piece of advice that I give people all the time is when you are sort of debating somebody on social media in particular, make sure you're not attacking them or focusing on them. Focus on the rest of the people who are listening in, even if they might not be visible to you at that time. Those are the people that you have a far better ability to sort of bring to your side than the person you might directly be talking to. Like even when I had people coming up to me uh, at the Ask a Muslim booth, all other people were listening in. And that's who, if we can focus instead of just that one person who might be the troll, who might be attacking us, who might be negative, if we can maintain our positivity, uh, you know, put our faith values into action, even in how we talk to people and interact with folks uh, and bring facts and information and statistics and data and everything else that we have to have some of to be able to respond to some of these questions, uh, I think that's how we create change. And of course, the personal relationships and short of the personal relationships, stories that we can all share about people from marginalized communities because personal stories and personal relationships are really powerful so I, I I think we're we're getting close to 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 completing this this particular episode here but I I just want to offer just just is there like um, you know when it's a tough day you know Hamza or Alana like what is it that that makes you re-engage the next day just in like 30 seconds or something like that. What What's that thing that makes you keep going? Uh, mine's a spiritual thing. Uh, Muslims technically pray five times a day, but there's a sixth prayer called Salat al which means the prayer of the night. It's a night vigil. And so that's kind of an informal, it's like the descent channel of Islam, uh, so to speak. That's when we can have a direct informal conversation with God and share with him how difficult our day has been. And that's usually when I, I vent directly and say, you know, this was not a fun day, God. I know that I'm supposed to be tested and I'm supposed to have, you know, be better at this than I am, but I need your help. This was hard. I need you to make tomorrow a better day for me, uh, please. And usually God responds with making the next day better. At least he makes my coffee taste better the next day because it's yam and coffee in you. Um, <laughs> But, you know, that, that's my way of dealing with it. It's just, you know, using that descent channel that God gave us as Muslims to, to talk with him and, and, you know, vent out my frustrations. Alana, how about you? So it's also a spiritual thing for me, but not necessarily in prayer. I think there's a certain sense in which I've, um, 
I've developed relationships with people who are in my own faith tradition and in other faith traditions, Christians, Muslims, Baha'i, and those relationships I find incredibly sustaining. And particularly in the ability to talk about what our spiritual connections to God are and how they're different. It's, it's not even in the similarities, it's the differences that I find incredibly sustaining and um, nourishing because they're, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't need to sit in my house and look at my walls. I know what my walls look like. I like to go and see what other people's houses look like and, you know, break bread with them and see, you know, what are their traditions like? And I think that it's, it's wonderful to know that there's, you know, there are ranch houses and mansions and cottages and, you know, and they're all, they're all places of shelter. Um, and we all find shelter in them and, and are able to live in them. And, and for me, likewise, I think uh, that with all of you, very, very similar in many ways that um, Jesus risked himself in love for his neighbor. Yeah. He risked himself because he loved his neighbor as he loved himself and because he loved God more than anything. He risked himself in love. And, and, uh, and so as a follower of Jesus, then, then we all have to listen for how are we called to risk in such a way that we love our neighbor, but we also still continue to care about uh, ourselves and recognize the beauty of life that God's given us. And, um, and so I look to Jesus, you know, people ask me, Terry, why are you doing this? And I say, well, because of Jesus. And, and that usually shocks people a little bit, but uh, um, it's, it's really, it's really why, why for me. So I want to thank you, uh, Hamza, Alana and Anila for being on with me tonight. And, and we, we hope to be back on again. Uh, we got to still figure out a schedule, but we hope to be on again once in a while here, maybe even once a month. I'll be talking uh, next week with Shanta Premawardhana from Omnia Leadership about the work they're doing with multi-faith peacemaking around the world. You can find out more about Paths to Understanding at pathstounderstanding.org. You'll find uh, Challenge 2.0 hosted by Jeff Renner on our YouTube channel. Uh, this, this broadcast will also be on our YouTube channel, as well as we're launching a podcast here in the next week or so. Um, you can go to the Facts Over Fear campaign to counter anti-Muslim bigotry at factsoverfear.org. I encourage all of you to be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors.